So welcome everyone. Um, thanks for attending my session today. I really do appreciate it. Uh, my name is Marco Kechikero. I am a senior tech writer on BlackBerry's Enterprise Docs team. Our website, which I'll be talking about quite a bit today, is docs.blackberry.com. Uh, I'm sure most of you have heard of BlackBerry before and possibly even owned a BlackBerry at some point, um, but you may not be familiar with what BlackBerry is now and what we do. Um, so BlackBerry today is a very diverse company with hands in a lot of different fields, including security consulting, automotive, and my area of the business, which is enterprise software. Um, so my business unit creates server software and mobile apps that allow businesses of all sizes to work more efficiently while protecting users and data from cyber threats. So this is actually my third Data World presentation and the continuation of a nice story arc in what has turned out to be a very good vendor relationship with Adobe. So my first Data World presentation was in 2018 and it was titled From Challenge Comes Opportunity. It focused on our initial migration to the XML documentation for Adobe Experience Manager CCMS, which is an extremely long name, so I'm just going to shorten it for the rest of the presentation to just the AEM CMS, for the sake of brevity, um, and focused on why we made that move and how we planned and executed a year-long DIY migration. The following year, my presentation was called From Opportunity Comes Innovation, and it focused on the innovative things that our team had been able to do after being live in the AEM CMS and in complete control of every aspect of the content creation process. This year's session, From Innovation Comes Solutions, will extend that theme and focus on how we've used the creative freedom provided by AEM to answer the challenges that our team has faced, challenges that I believe we have in common with other tech writing teams across different industries. Before we dive into those challenges, I thought it would be helpful to give a very quick summary of BlackBerry's history with the system and why we chose it over other CCMS options. So back in 2017, our company was in a period of transition. After several corporate changes, uh, we found ourselves in a difficult spot. We had a team of experienced and professional tech writers, but we were very limited by the tech that we had on hand. We had a DITA CMS that was aging and it really hadn't made any significant leaps forward in usability or high value features in years. We had a customer facing website that was built in house and was hampered by a limited feature set and several design issues. On top of that, the IT team that managed and maintained both of these systems for us was suddenly dissolved and moved to other areas of the business, effectively leaving us on a tight rope without a safety net. We had this great team of writers, but we were handcuffed by data technology that we couldn't control or improve. We knew the only way out of that situation would be to switch to a new data CMS, one that would remove those technical limitations and give us more control over what we create and how we present it to customers. After looking at several options, the Adobe AEM CMS stood out above the rest because of some key factors. Those key factors are actually at the core of what I'll be speaking about today unique features that allowed us to take back the creative direction of our content and our future. So the biggest advantage of the AEM CMS is that it is a plug-in for the Adobe Experience Manager web platform. It offers a complete CMS that gives you what you need to author, review, and generate data content into different formats, while also giving you the ability to design, construct, and publish a complete website that features your data content. Our team saw an opportunity to go from having zero control over our CMS and website to having complete control over both tools. We could choose how to implement the CMS, introducing streamlined processes along the way, and we could work with BlackBerry's web team who had already been using AEM for years to construct a new docs site from the ground up. We worked with our web team to develop templates that we could use to build our new site's landing pages and product pages. We laid out the types of content we needed the site to support, you know, text, images, videos, page banners, and so on. And the web team set us up with the templates that made it easy for our writers to add and modify any of these components. These AEM web templates are intuitive and easy to learn. Once you understand how to add and arrange different components like images, text boxes, column controls, links to your generated data content, et cetera, um, you have a toolbox that you can use to build whatever you need. And, and I figured the best way to show you that is to actually show you that. Um, so here, I'm just gonna log into our live system here. And I'm gonna show you the back end of one of the product pages that I own and create and release onto the site. So this is a brand new product that's just released today. Um, so this is a product BlackBerry creates called BlackBerry Protect Mobile. 
Uh, and as you can see here, as I, as I hover over here, this is the, the web template that the web team set up for us. And really it's just a combination of different web components that writers can simply add and configure to build and construct a web page. So you can see here there's button components, image components, text components. There's product boxes here, which are actually serving as my links to my generated data content. Really, we, we always use the analogy when we're training our new writers that we have all the Lego blocks we need to build our website and construct anything we need, and it's because of the ease of use of the AEM web templates. Once we had these templates in place, <clears throat> we had complete control over our new site. We could design the flow, decide how to arrange and categorize pages, how to link between pages, determine our own URL structure, and so on. Our web team set us up with a full AEM toolbox, and now we use those tools as a team of writers to run our own operations day to day. The AEM CMS also gives you tight integration between your data content and the website that you construct using the web templates. Once you design your PDF and HTML outputs, <clears throat> you can generate your content with a single click. This will store your content where you want it to live in the site structure, and you can link your web pages to the generated content for a seamless customer experience. And what I'm showing you now is actually my data map for the product page I just showed you, uh, my Protect Mobile UES admin guide. Um, what I've done here is configure my generation outputs, right? My output presets where I'm just telling it, you know, where do I want my output content to go? What baseline, what version do I want it to use? where to store it in the system, what data valve to use, et cetera. And then to generate it, you simply select it, click generate, and it produces the HTML and PDF version. And I can actually show you the previous versions here, even though it'll only take about 10 seconds or so to generate. Um, so this is the latest HTML version that I created, and this is what gets stored in my site structure and linked to my web page. And they use the same CSS, so you have a consistent design between the web page, the entire website, and the generated data content so that there is no separation between the two. Shut up my outlook here. <clears throat> All right. So if I need to update or fix content, I simply change my topics, generate a new output, and publish the update. If I want to change the design of one of my pages, I can modify the page components and push it live. If our team wants to rearrange the site and completely redesign the landing page or URL structure, we know exactly what AEM elements to work with and how to do so. The level of control we have over our content in the web front end has given us the freedom and agility to answer any challenges that come our way. Taking that theme one step further, the AEM CMS uses a very flexible metadata and tagging model that you can use for many different purposes. Define and associate custom metadata with your data topics, maps, and images to meet specific needs. I can give you two quick examples of that right now. Um, so on our maps, we've defined some very simple metadata fields at the map level. So if you go into a maps properties, we have this new data tab where we just specify product name, guide name, subtitle if needed, and version if needed. Um, so really what this metadata use is used for is three specific purposes. Um, the first purpose is that it's used to populate the cover page of our PDF outputs. So that information you put in those fields is used to populate the cover page. On the HTML outputs, it's used to display information in the top left. So the, no matter what topic you go on to in the guide, um, you always see that <clears throat> identifying information in the top left. Furthermore, this metadata is also leveraged by the site's search engine so that the same metadata is also leveraged by the Caveo search engine that's underlying docs.blackberry.com. Um, so this is just an example of a simple search for the terms BlackBerry Protect UEM from our search engine. That same metadata that was entered by the writer appears as filtering options. So if somebody wants to further filter down their searches by version, um, by guide name, or by product type, they can leverage the exact same metadata to do so. Another quick example of how we how we use meta, metadata and actually an example of how we plan to use metadata uh, is something we're working on right now, which is the concept of content as a service. Um, so what I'm showing you now is just kind of a mock-up of what we have in progress. But the whole idea is basically we want to create a front-facing page on our site that allows customers to choose a product and a type of compatibility information they want to view. Um, these drop-downs basically correspond to metadata that is applied to generated topics that live on our site. So the idea is that the customer would choose the product and the type of compatibility information 
they would submit this information and the logic of that site would go and look for the topic that has that corresponding metadata and then format it and present it to the customer immediately at that moment of need. Um, so again, those are just two quick examples of the flexibility of the metadata and tagging model and how you can use it for all types of different custom purposes. Another key advantage is that the AEM CMS gives you the features you would expect from a high-end CMS, but also implements them in ways that are intuitive and easy to execute. And I'll give you just a few examples to illustrate. Um, the Map Builder tool of the AEM CMS is actually very easy to use, um, and I'll show you exactly what it looks like here. Um, so this is just a simple map here that I've constructed and used for one of my releases. I'll just flip it into edit mode just to show you how easy it is to construct or update a map in minutes. You have your repo here on the left pane where you simply search for content and drag and drop it. Um, to modify the map hierarchy, you can just use the arrows to move things in and out. You could select objects and delete them. You could group them together and drag and drop them to different positions. You can apply conditions by applying different uh, conditional attribute fields. Uh, and so on and so forth. It's very much an intuitive and easy design that allows you to both build and update maps very quickly and very easily. Hey everybody, it looks like Marco may have dropped for just a moment here. So we're going to if we can recover and I will keep going while we get Devon uh, checking in on him. And we have Ritesh, perhaps we could can we pause the recording. Double check in here. Stefan, do we have you in the room? All right, we got Marco coming back oh. in. I'm very sorry, folks. I accidentally closed my whole browser instead of just closing the screen. Uh, no worries. We, we <laughs> that, my, uh, let everybody know. Sincere apologies for that one. Sure. Well, we'll just let, uh, let you know. There we go. Yeah, let me know if you guys can ready. see me. You are ready to go again, sir. Go ahead and All take right. it away. Great. Thank you. Apologies again for that uh, disruption there. Um, the system also offers a very sophisticated versioning model, um, giving you the granular, granular control that you need to capture the state of your content at any moment in time, given your current, or whether it's your current release or a past release. And again, I'll show you that very quickly. So if we flip to the baseline, the baseline is the system's version control mechanism. Uh, and this is an example of one of my baselines, where essentially I have my map and all of my data topics. And you can see here that I've cherry picked the specific version I want to use of, of every topic, represent a specific moment in time. Um, and the system offers very easy tools in order for you to immediately pick the right version based on a specific date or time. And you can customize all of the versions that you're using of all of these objects as well. Lastly, um, common data authoring features are implemented in a practical and functional way. And I'll give you just a few examples of those. Um, they've, they've made some drastic improvements lately to a lot of the usability features of the author um, that have really drastically improved the experience. And one really good example of that, I'm sure that I'm connected to the right profile here, uh, is the fact that you can navigate your entire docs repo directly from the author. So you don't, you still have the option, of course, to navigate through the tree and open whatever you want, but uh, you can also do it from within the author now. You can nav navigate to any of your docs folders and you can open as many topics as you want at the same time and jump between different topics within the same authoring view. Of course, I went down a rabbit hole here of somebody else's content instead of my own. <laughs> Okay, uh, another quick and easy feature as well, if you wanna add internal links, you can do so directly and easily from the repo view as well. So you can simply drag and drop a topic into your current authored topic. You insert an XREF immediately to that topic. Um, there's some very nice features as well that they've added, some new panels like the conditions panel. These are all of the conditions that we use. And now to apply these conditions, it's as simple as dragging and dropping into an element and you can color code them as much as you want to apply conditional text. 
You have easy wizards as well within the authoring uh, menu bar. So you can easily go through these wizards and search for or navigate to an image to insert it. Um, same kind of thing for inserting internal links to other topics, inserting web links. Um, <clears throat> And also the right-click menu gives you a lot of very easy options as well. So you have a bold tag here if you wanted to swap that out for another element. It's as simple as just typing it into the context-sensitive menu, and you've just swapped that in for bold to a UI control element, uh, among other many useful um, options within the right-click menu. Um, also extremely important as well is the tool has very good error validation checks. So let's say for example you accidentally delete one of the brackets here, it immediately screams at you and tells you what's wrong and what you need to do to fix it so that you don't mess anything up and it's not going to allow you to save until you've completed um, that fix and, and rectify that error. So really the system doesn't reinvent the wheel when it comes to DITA, um, but it does make it easier to learn and use DITA day to day. This gives you both the freedom and opportunity to be more creative in how you use DITA to answer the needs of your business and your customers. So the challenges that our tech writing team faces generally come from one of two directions. Business challenges that are driven by the company and what it needs us to communicate to our audience, and content challenges that are more internal to our team and involve making decisions about how to design, present, and maintain content so that it best serves our audience content strategies. So for the rest of the session, we'll dive into seven such challenges and how our team has used the AEM CMS and platform to answer them. BlackBerry's enterprise products are marketed and sold as suites, different combinations of products to meet different business needs. Within an org, there's often a divide between the tech writing team that documents how to use a product and the marketing and sales teams that promote and sell products. Both have different goals, use different language, and have different targets. Historically, our tech docs have avoided any in-depth documentation about product suites because the makeup of those suites often change. We don't want to tie our docs too closely to a given suite because changes to that suite could demand frequent changes to our docs. In the past, we've opted to reference suites in a pretty minor way, simply listing the suites that a given product belongs to. We wanted the docs to stand on their own so they would be useful regardless of the suites a product is part of. We learned recently that our customers want more guidance when it comes to suites. Before they make a purchase, they want more technical specifics about the products, how they interact with one another, and whether they are targeted at admins or end users. After a purchase, they wanted more quick start information to get up and running. So the challenge we faced here was really about how the tech docs could bridge that gap and number one, do a better job of telling the story of a product suite, and two, how we could do a better job of guiding customers so they know what docs to use and in what order after they make a purchase. We believe the answer to these challenges wasn't really more documentation. We wanted something more accessible, something that could convey information efficiently and serve as a gateway to the detailed info in our docs. To tell the story of each suite, we decided to experiment with some new ideas that emphasize attractive visuals, <clears throat> the iconography of our products, and minimalist plain language that would allow anyone, regardless of background, to understand what we offer. Our AEM web templates gave us everything we needed to pull these ideas together and create an accessible gateway to our suites. And I'll show you exactly what we ended up creating. So from our site's landing page, <clears throat> you can actually jump into this new block where you can learn about the BlackBerry Spark suites. Um, the initial page here is just designed to give you a taste of the different suites and the scope of them, why you might be interested in one particular suite over another with some very short descriptions and some very quick iconography. From this point, once we've kind of whet your appetite, you can click on the image or the text to actually go to the detail page for that suite. Um, and the major feature of each suite detail page is a large diagram that uses images, icons, and very few words to tell a complete story. What does every product in the suite do? Who uses it, whether it's a user or an administrator? Where does it sit in the overall domain, whether it's on the device or on a laptop or in the cloud or part of a server infrastructure or network infrastructure? And what relationship do all of these products have to one another? Every icon in the diagram corresponds to the short descriptions and product names below. We consciously chose to use different language for these descriptions. Avoid the buzzwords and technical terms and just state in plain language what the product is and why it's valuable. Every icon in the description 
and description, then links to the full documentation set for that product, where the customer can access all of the technical information they need, whether it's admin guides, user guides, release notes, etc. Um, building these pages in AEM was very easy because we had all of the tools that we needed on hand. Just like I showed you before, it's just a custom template that gets set up and it's a combination of different components. Uh, in this case, it's a combination of a hero banner component, a large image component, different column controls, different image components, text components, and various links to direct to the pages that we want. Um, so really this resource that we created gave us access via these very friendly web tools gave us a way to help customers by telling them the story in a more efficient and effective way and guiding them to our documentation. Uh, our answer to the second challenge, how to guide customers to the right docs in the right order um, to get set up, leans more heavily on the traditional use of DITA, but using it to provide signposts to the right docs rather than just producing more docs. Um, so what we actually have in progress right now is what we call a quick start resource. Uh, and as you can tell, it's it's more traditional doc style using DITA, uh, where basically it's something that it's used in the structure of a table, it's using iconography to represent different products. Um, the, the purpose of this resource is to give you kind of a quick start resource happy path to get you up and running after you've purchased a suite. Every row in the table corresponds to one of the products you, you have purchased and received. And what we're doing in each row is giving you links that direct you to the documentation to get you up and running. <clears throat> um, every step links out to existing docs and will always hit the latest docs, so this resource will not fall out of date. When a product sees a new release, the setup link will always point to the latest information, keeping this quick start relevant and future-proof. If a suite changes, we can simply add or remove rows as necessary. So by offering a clean quick start resource generated and controlled from data content, we can help our customers by tying together the different doc sets that are relevant for a given suite and provide a clear order of operations that customers and our support teams can follow. Um, so the next challenge, how do you adapt tech docs to fit the unique challenges of a beta release? BlackBerry's beta program is a key to the success of our products, as it allows customers to test drive our software prior to release and share valuable feedback. Producing docs for a beta release can pose some unique challenges for a tech docs team. Um, to share two specific ones that we've had at BlackBerry, um, first is that significant features can be pulled at the last minute if they're not ready in time for the beta start date. This is easy for the dev team to manage as they can simply cut a different code branch, um, but it's hard for the tech docs to account for. Uh, and secondly, beta customers often want to test new features by running through the same test cases as our QA team. They can sometimes just follow these test cases instead of reading through the official docs, which are more carefully laid out and designed to help them avoid pitfalls. Ultimately, our answer to both challenges would be found in how some valuable data features are implemented in the AEM CMS. To account for the possibility of a key feature getting pulled a day or two before beta release, the solution lie in a very common data feature, conditional attributes. For each feature that was at risk of possibly getting pulled, I could create two conditions, one that assumed that the feature would be included and make it in, and one that assumed that the feature could be removed. And I'll show you what I mean in our conditional preset here. Um, so for example here, I had this particular feature about detecting side-loaded apps on Android devices that was at risk of possibly not making the beta date. What I did was create these two versions of this condition, an on condition, assuming that the feature makes it in, and an off version, assuming that the feature gets pulled at the last minute. I authored my content for both eventualities and applied this condition um, as appropriate. And you can see here, I've done it for a couple different features. Um, and the reason why this was useful was because it gave me maximum flexibility. Regardless of how the project went and regardless of what ended up making it into the beta release, my docs could account for every eventuality. Um, the reason why this was easy to do in the system was because conditional presets are a nice feature of maps where basically it just pulls all of the conditions at, at use in the map and then allows me to set for each one whether to include it or exclude it. And I could change and update, update these on the fly so that once the project team made their choice, I could, make these, uh, I could make these changes and have my docs match exactly the feature set that would be delivered. Uh, another nice feature was the fact that all of these conditions were essentially temporary, right, and would not be used after this beta release. 
So instead of cluttering up everybody else's view, I just associated them with a different folder profile that only I connected to, so nobody else had to worry about these conditions. Um, for the purpose of a beta release, this method was very effective. Regardless of the decisions made by the dev team, my docs accounted for all the different possibilities. It was a bit of extra overhead, but it paid off with maximum flexibility, and it wasn't wasted effort. After the beta drops, I could simply remove the conditions and adjust the content as needed for final release. For the second part of the challenge, how to reconcile the official docs with the less formal QA test cases the customers wanted, we found that the solution was to do what tech writers do best. Take the informal QA test cases and formalize them into a structured data template with a clear flow of steps. This allowed us to better control the quality and flow of the content and link to the official docs where appropriate to keep our messaging and directions consistent. And I'll show you exactly what that looks like. Um, so what I'm gonna display to you right now is the original test cases as handed to me by the QA team. Um, for older betas, we basically would just put these in a Word file and hand them over, um, which caused some issues. <laughs> uh, ultimately, these were written by testers and for testers, so they're not the same thing as like a nice clean doc, uh, document produced by a tech docs team, right? There's a lot of repeated prerequisites, a lot of informal language, a bit of a questionable structure in terms of, you know, do this action, see this result. Um, so it's not exactly always easy to flow and oftentimes mentions things that doesn't don't necessarily need to be mentioned. Um, it's rather lengthy and repeats quite a few things. Um, so my answer to that was basically to doxify it, right? So put it in a data template and give it a defined structure to it, which allowed me to do a lot of beneficial things, right? I could basically get rid of all those repeated prerequisites and just have one set of prereqs that apply to all of the test cases. I could have the test cases flow into one another and build on each other. Instead of repeating things over and over again, I could simply add links to my documentation and deliver this test case within the doc. So it's all one unified resource and keeps customers looking at the official docs. Um, I could, you know, give more consistency and clarity and branding, you know, approved branding to the language and the structure. Um, I could omit obvious results and just build in the very important results as bullet points and the different steps. Um, so after working this test case, um, these reworked test cases into the beta documentation as part of the date beta documentation, customers now hit a single one-stop shop for all info about the product, and it encouraged them to review and use the official docs as they worked through the test case. Diving into the next challenge, how do you integrate your technical content with product software in a way that is effective and flexible? So how to offer context-sensitive help is an important question for any software product. You want your customer to have easy access to the docs that are relevant to the UI they are using right at that moment of need. There are many ways to do this, including implementing the docs directly into software builds, adding help text directly into the UI, and offering links in the UI directly going to online docs. Every method, of course, has its own pitfalls. Um, for example, if you're adding the documentation right into the software builds to be opened up in, um, you know, as part of the software. Obviously you need to deliver your docs early, which can sometimes mean that you miss late changes from development. Um, the key is really figuring out which approach makes the most sense for your product, your customer, and your writers. Our move into the AEM CMS gave us a chance to reevaluate how we deliver context help in our software and do something more dynamic and flexible. The AEM platform allows you to create simple redirect objects. You can define a specific URL that when a customer hits it, will redirect to whatever online content you want. The redirect URL that you define does not change, but you can change the destination at any time. So what I'm showing you in this screenshot here is just a simple redirect object that we created in the system. Um, it's identified by a specific URL with a string at the end that uniquely identifies it. Uh, and we've published it onto our site and I've configured it to point to a very specific topic. So if anybody hits this redirect URL, it then gets redirected to the right topic of relevant content on our site. So many of our products uh, are tied to a unified web console that customers use to manage several different products. In AEM, we created a single container that basically has all of the help links um, that are associated with this console. I can show you right here. 
This is the back end of our website. This is our context sensitive help object. And all of these are unique redirects um, that each point to a specific help topic and is each tied to a different screen of the UI. These are all redirects that are uniquely identified by the string at the end of them. Um, so why use these redirects? Why is this valuable? Instead of the product UI featuring direct links to online topics, we can give our developers the static, unchanging redirect URLs. They build these URLs into visual help links in the product UI, like this little question mark I hear next to the name of a particular page. Um, and when the customer clicks it, they go to that redirect URL, and then they get redirected to the relevant content for that page. So the customer gets the info they need for the UI they are currently using. The dev team gets to implement links that they don't have to change with every release. And the tech writer has the ability to update and modify both the redirect objects and the online help content at any time, getting maximum control over the entire thing. Um, diving into the next challenge, how do you address the pain points of your product in a way that speaks to your customer? Every product has its pain points. Certain aspects of the customer experience that are more likely to cause frustration or calls to your support team or negative feedback. By its nature, tech docs are designed to avoid that frustration as much as possible by organizing info and providing clear instructions. Regardless, pain points will always exist and they are often things completely out of the control of the tech writer. For example, a UI experience that may be a little too slow or not well implemented or a software bug that prevents things from working exactly as expected. So how can a tech docs team address the specific pain points of a given product using the tools on hand? How do you best engage a customer who is coming at your docs in a state of frustration? So for our team's response to this challenge, I need to give some credit to the keynote speaker at a CIDM conference I attended a few years ago. <clears throat> His name is Adam Toporek, uh, a customer experience strategist who wrote a book titled, Be Your Customer's Hero. His session was all about ways to position your content so that it can address the heightened state of frustration customers often have when they come to product docs. I took two key things away from his session. When you aim to address a pain point, don't be afraid to think outside the box and try things you don't typically do in your technical content. And don't be afraid to use less formal, more casual language to establish a human connection with your customer. With these points in mind and with the AEM toolbox at our disposal, we started to think about ways we could work outside the box to produce targeted, high-value content to address these pain points. This resource would be a companion piece to our standard technical content designed with the simple goal of taking something that can be complex and frustrating, making it simple and straightforward. So what we ended up creating is a new resource that we call a workflow. A workflow is a single web page created with an AEM web template that features the following key elements. And what better way to show you than to show you a real one. <laughs> um, so this is a workflow for a product called BlackBerry Persona. Um, it's all about um, essentially how to define custom security geo zones for this product. So a workflow will always start off with a clear goal-oriented title that tells you exactly what you are going to accomplish and why. It will always feature 10 steps or less to guide the customer directly to that goal. Every step must have a screenshot to clearly illustrate the action and is as important as the text for conveying key information. Each step must also have a title to communicate the action. The step is very straightforward. It may simply just have a title and nothing else. Steps that require a bit more info can have one to two sentences max of additional text to guide the user. All text should be as minimalist as possible, using the same informal language that you would use if you were teaching someone in person. And again, to go back to Adam Toprek's point, um, trying to establish that human connection to reduce the, that frustration that the customer may be experiencing. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Okay, every step must be lean and direct. If you want to address more options or particulars, include a very short tip. That right here. And the end of the workflow is very important because it's, it's designed to give you a link to the full docs, allowing it to serve as a gateway to 
the rest of our documentation. So workflows offer several advantages. They give us the opportunity to use screenshots, um, which customers love, but tech writers tend to hate, uh, mainly due to the maintenance and translation costs that often come with them. Design workflows to be applicable across One second. Hello? Hello? Yes? Yes? And we have real life entering in again as he addresses his phone. <laughs> Marco, let us know what you're talking about. I'm sorry about that. Sorry, I thought uh, I was having an issue with the recording. But I answered my phone. I thought maybe Stefan was calling, but it wasn't. Sorry about that. All right, I'll yeah, continue. we're good. <laughs> All right, was great. not me. <laughs> great. Sorry, I thought I thought maybe something was wrong with the uh, the recording, so I just answered the phone. But that's alright. Let's continue. <laughs> um, okay. So in terms of the advantages of the workflow, so again, um, they give us the chance to use screenshots, um, which we often avoid in our technical docs, um, but really they're very useful uh, in terms of these workflows because the power of visuals can really go a long way towards simplifying a complex idea. Um, because the AEM templates are easy to populate, you can produce and release a workflow in as little as a single day. This is a big advantage over other types of dynamic media, such as videos, which can take a month or more to create. Tech docs must be comprehensive, but workflows can choose a specific path to a goal and be more focused. Once a customer completes this initial path, they can explore other options. Workflows are visually appealing and easy to share. We can produce workflows for big call drivers based on info from support, then give support a new tool they use when they interact with customers. Uh, and workflows are accessible. Most customers are much more willing to go through a 10-step workflow than they are to read a full docs chapter consisting mainly of text. Once you hook them, um, once you hook them with a workflow, you guide them to the detailed info. Um, and lastly, workflows are flexible and can be used to highlight many aspects of a product beyond just the pain points. We started using them about a year and a half ago. Their use has expanded to replacing shorter user guides, highlighting new high value features, providing quick start instructions, and even for guiding beta customers on how to use our forum. Just to show you really quickly, we have one writer who's kind of loved workflows so much that she's chosen to replace some of her smaller user guides with an assortment of different workflows for how to accomplish different tasks. Uh, and they're also an important part of our beta program and our intern has been creating workflows recently to help customers get set up in the beta form. So moving on to the next challenge, how do you guide customers to the right docs for their product or use case? For teams that manage docs for many products, one of the difficulties is how to deal with the sheer volume of content on your site. Docs.bb.com is home to docs that for more than 60 products um, serving different audiences like enterprise admins, commercial and corporate end users, and enterprise developers. Content navigation can be a challenge when dealing with large products as well. For example, our flagship product, BlackBerry UEM, is a large product with many, many documents, but it also has a lot of sister products and plugins, um, each with their own dedicated doc set. This can result in a pretty sophisticated web of docs and cross-references. When you have so much content for different audiences, how do you help people find what they want, be they prospective or existing customers? When you have a complex product with many different aspects and sister products, how do you help customers zero in to find what they need? This is another case where we believe the answer wasn't more docs, but a new resource produced entirely using data that would lead customers to the content they need when they need it. We developed what we ended up calling a doc map, which at its core is a series of questions or options that are posed to the customer in a considered flow. At the end of this process, you arrive at the content that you need. So this is a bit different from the overall layout of our site, where our landing page is basically asking you to identify, you know, what is your product? And then once you identify your product, you can view the docs for that product and dive in. Um, the, the doc map idea is a little bit different. Um, the point of it is basically you start with your use case or your intent, you make your choices and we'll get you there quickly. And I'll show you two examples of how we've implemented that. At the site level, we have this button here that asks, let us help you find something. Uh, and the first question or option we give you is, you know, what type of user are you? Are you an end user with BlackBerry apps? Are you an admin who needs help with a specific product? 
Um, and then you make your choice. So let's say you are an end user with BlackBerry apps on your phone. Uh, and let's say you need help with a specific work, back, work app or you need help connecting your, connecting your device to BlackBerry UEM. You click on that option. And then from here, again, you drill down and you choose the option that best suits what you're looking for. So let's say you want either videos or you want device activation instructions, and then we guide you directly to that content of relevance. So in about three clicks, we've started with your use case and guided you directly to the docs that are valuable. Um, taking this for another example, focusing on, on a specific product. So let's say the UEM product. Again, it's the same starting point of let us help you find something. Uh, and again, we asked you, what type of user are you, right? Are you an end user who needs access to work information? Am I an admin who needs help with a specific task? Say I choose this option here. <clears throat> Let's say I want to know how to deactivate or locate a device or send a command to a device. Let's choose this option here, sending a command to a device. And we lead you directly to the content of relevance. Um, so the doc map has really allowed us to leverage common data features and output to add a new navigation layer to our site. It's optional for those who want it. It's effective at identifying and serving customer needs. And it's easy to maintain because it's designed to always point to the latest available content. And it doesn't contain technical content itself. We only have to update it if we want to highlight new use cases or add new links or new products or features. All right, we're in the home stretch, a couple more to go. <laughs> How do you design HTML content so that it considers common entry points from search engines like Google? Um, any good tech doc is designed to guide the user from understanding to preparation to action. Our team takes a lot of pride in how we structure our data content to take customers from point A to B in as few steps as possible, educating them along the way. Each doc is designed to tell a story with a beginning, middle and end and works best when followed in sequence. At the same time, we accept the reality that a customer can drop into any part of our online docs at any given time given the ubiquitous nature of Google and other search engines. When someone is looking for information and don't know where to find it, they use Google or possibly the search engine on docs.blackberry.com if they are familiar with our site, and the search will surface the most relevant content and they can click and dive right in. This means that a customer might start at the middle or near the end of the quote unquote story and might miss some key pieces of info or prerequisites. So how do you design your online content so that customers can easily find the right information and follow the right flow of tasks when they get dropped into the middle of a larger flow of topics? First method we used to address this was to design a good table of contents for our data HTML content. Exactly what that looks like. Because the table of contents is always visible to the left of content, it becomes a key tool for positioning yourself in the doc and understanding what comes before and after the current topic, as well as other valuable sections that you might need to look at. We also wanted to make sure that the TOC allowed for exploration without having to leave the current topic. Being able to expand and navigate through the whole document via the TOC gives the customer valuable info and clear signposts for both where they are and where they might want to go next. For chapters that involve multiple tasks to accomplish a larger goal, for example, enabling and configuring a service for users, we use what we call a steps to topic. I'll show you a live steps to topic on our site. The steps to topic will always open a chapter, <clears throat> providing a table with numbered rows that clearly communicate the overall steps with links to those specific topics at each step. Steps to topics are practical and serve as a kind of synopsis for the customer, giving a clear expectation of what will follow and the sequence they will need to complete to accomplish the larger goal. We use data templates to construct these steps to topics so they are easy to create and populate with images and internal links. In our use of data elements, we make it a point to leverage prereq and postreq elements to support a very clear flow of tasks or our HTML output formats. Uh, in a given task, the prerequisite element will provide links to the topics that must be completed first. The postrequisite element uh, will give links to the tasks that must be completed next. By leveraging these elements and emphasizing them in our task templates, 
we encourage writers to set up a coherent chain of topics where the previous link and the next link in the chain are always clear. We also wanted to be sure that the HTML output format would automatically add links to help customers navigate the information. At the bottom of each topic, the format automatically adds a link to the parent topic of that chapter with a clear section label, as well as links to child topics if there are any for that particular topic. In that example there, I let's say Google dropped me into the middle of this given chapter, the automated links at the end of the topic can help me navigate my way back to the beginning of the chapter, and then the automated links for the child topics can help me jump to whatever I need. These simple links help position the current topic as part of a flow and allow customers to work backwards as necessary to get to the beginning of a given section. They are also very valuable to help us guide customers to those steps to topics. Another modification to the HTML output is the get the PDF link that we add to our online content. Exactly what that looks like. We worked with our web developer to add a simple AEM component to our HTML output, which we configure and point to the PDF version of a doc. From any topic in our HTML content, regardless of where you click throughout the deliverable, you will always see this get the PDF link which a customer can click to access the fully searchable PDF, um, which is a format that many customers still prefer to use and navigate through. Finally, we also worked with our web team to implement a navigation bar for the site that would be easy for our team to customize and manage. So clicking a BlackBerry Docs link from Google doesn't always land you in the right Docs set. The navigation bar offers another method for browsing the site quickly and finding the docs that you want. So let's say, for example, you're looking for use cases for a particular product, but you end up in a doc set that's not quite what you're looking for. Um, no matter where you are on our site, you will always have access to this nav bar, and the nav bar will allow you to jump wherever you want to go, whatever product doc set you want to see. The most important element of the nav bar is really how it has been implemented. We consciously developed something with our web team that would be easy for us to customize going forward. The back end of the nav bar is simply a collection of AEM components, which I'll show you right now. So you can see here all of these headers correspond to all of the different elements of the nav bar. And really configuring the nav bar is as simple as just choosing any of these components, going into the edit menu, and then again, just like I do on all of the different web pages, edit mode there, I can just configure it and customize it, right? I can choose what I want the menu items to be, what I want them to link to, I can delete them easily, I can add them easily, I can drag this to reorganize them very easily. Um, what this really means is that I don't have to rely on the web team or on IT to keep the, the nav bar up to date or to reorganize it. I can do it within minutes as a writer because the AEM tools are set up and available to me. As soon as I make these changes, I can simply roll it out and publish it, and I can have those changes represented on the live site in just a few minutes. So really in summary, site and content navigation are always a challenge, but the combination of all of these different design choices, both big and small, have resulted in a site that is easy to navigate regardless of how a customer is coming to it. Uh, and diving into the last challenge here, how do you encourage the consistent use of DITA elements across docs and different writers? Our team has been using DITA for about 12 years now. We're big supporters of it, and we believe in the advantages that it offers, from simplifying translation to encouraging consistent structure and content design across a team's docs. The beauty of DITA is that it enforces structured writing, but also allows for freedom and choice in what elements are used, how they are used, and how they are treated by your output formats. Once your team makes these decisions and sets up templates, your writers are off to the races and you can use your set, set standards to produce consistent content. Even though this is the ideal, it's inevitable that some writers may use elements in ways that are not consistent with your standards. For example, they may choose to use a simple table instead of a standard table. They may choose to format tables in a bit of a different way. They may forget to set certain properties on external or internal links and so on. Um, so even within the realm of structured writing, there's always potential to use data elements in different ways that can introduce inconsistencies across documents. 
So how do you make it easier for writers to adhere to standards and use elements consistently across the team? One method is to build out your templates as much as possible and do as much pre-formatting as possible within them, so writers can simply copy and paste elements and populate them as needed. Uh, and I can show you an example of the BlackBerry task template that we use almost every day. Um, so let me just open up this guy here. Edit mode here and turn on the tags on view. So this is just a simple task template that we've created. Yeah. Where really we try to pre-populate it with more options than a given writer would need in a single task, right? So we have different types of notes like cautions and tips. Um, we build the prerequisite already with some bulleted list formatting options. We include choices, we include task tables, we include code sample examples, sub steps, different types of results and examples. We build in the post rec already. Um, the point being that you, you do a lot of the work already for the writer so that really all they have to do is delete what they don't need, keep what they do need, and copy and populate it however many times they do need. Um, so that really does go a long way towards helping to enforce your standards when you already set it up in the template for them already. A second method involves a brand new feature that was introduced <clears throat> in the most recent version of the AEM CMS called snippets. Snippets are predefined collections of XML syntax that you can define, save, and make available for anyone on your team to insert and use in their data topics. And I'll show you exactly what a snippet looks like in the system here. Profile. So this is a list of snippets that I've actually defined for the team that we've been using for a little while now. Uh, and I'll show you an example of one of our snippets here. This is for a code example in a task. So if I go into edit here, you can see that it's just some predefined XML syntax that has example, a title, and a code block element with some placeholder text here that the writer would then populate. So you can define as many of these different snippets that you want, the whole idea being that you set it up for them and pre-format it for them as much as possible, which is particularly useful when it comes to things like tables, because there are lots of different ways to set up tables in terms of column proportions or you know, putting paragraphs elements within cells or using specific labels for the column headers. Um, the more you can set up for them in a snippet and can then just be inserted in within topics, it just makes life easier for the writer. <clears throat> So to show you a few of these snippets in action here, let's say I want to insert a task table at this particular position here. I can just go to the info snippet with the task table and then insert it. You can also drag and drop it, it's just another option. Uh, and then really all the writer has to do is populate it with their content. Same kind of thing, delete this, let's say it's a description table, right? If this particular step requires a few options that need to be described, same deal, you insert, then you just populate. Um, you can use it also for different uh, things like, let's say, links, right? We have particular links to KB articles that use a particular structure to them. Um, so we've set up one for KB links where you can just insert the snippet. Then all the writer has to do is populate the URL with the right number, and they're done. Uh, it's already been pre-populated -po pre or pre-formatted with the right format property and scope property. So by using snippets, you make it easier to achieve consistency in the use of DITA, and you make DITA easier to use by giving writers handy shortcuts that they can leverage on a daily basis. So that brings us to the end of my session today. Uh, I hope that this look into how BlackBerry has used the AEM web platform and CMS plugin to answer different business and content challenges has been useful to you. Um, I just want to take a quick moment again to thank everyone for your time and attention. I really do appreciate it. Um, I think we may have a little bit of time now for q and I'll, I'll kind of let um, Stefan lead that. Um, but if you're not able to ask your question, and I will stick around as well uh, afterwards in the, in the chat there to see if I can answer as much as I can. Um, but if you'd like to reach out to me directly, please do feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. I should be the only Marco Ketchikero on there. Um, or send me an email at mketchikero at blackberry.com.